Hey everyone, this lesson is on typhoid fever. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what causes typhoid fever. We're also going to talk about the pathogenesis, signs and symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of typhoid fever. So typhoid fever is caused by an infection with the gram-negative bacteria Seminella enterica serovar typhi, or simply Seminella typhi, or a related bacteria Seminella paratyphi, which has different subtypes A, B, or C. Both of these bacteria cause slightly different clinical presentations, but we generally call infections by both of these typhoid fever. There's also the term we used enteric fever, which describes both the typhoid and paratyphoid fever. So we can use typhoid fever or enteric fever interchangeably. How is typhoid fever transmitted? Well, humans are actually the only reservoir for this type of bacteria. So it has to come from a human to another human. So either can this can be through direct contact or indirect contact via contaminated food or water. Now, the risk factors for contracting typhoid fever include being a child or young adult. Children and young adults are more susceptible to typhoid fever. Another one is overcrowding. So you can imagine if there's lots of people, if anybody's infected, they can easily transmit it through direct or indirect contact. And poor sanitation is also another risk factor. So again, through contaminated food and water, if there's poor sanitation with regards to the food or water, it's easier to transmit this. So how does Seminella typhi and Seminella paratyphi infect us and make us sick to cause typhoid fever? Well, these bacteria are ingested orally and they actually survive the gastric acids and then enter into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. When they enter the duodenum, they actually can penetrate through intestinal epithelium and invade into lymphoid tissue. And they do so by a couple of different mechanisms. One is through an M cell, which is part of the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue system or malt system. And the second way that this bacteria can actually penetrate into the epithelium is through direct penetration into an epithelial cell via CFTR or cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, which is a chloride ion channel. So you might be thinking cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, what does this mean? Well, this is actually the chloride ion channel that is mutated in patients with cystic fibrosis. So essentially what happens is the Seminella typhi or paratyphi utilize or hijack this chloride ion channel and use it to enter into intestinal epithelial cells. So what's very interesting is that because this channel is mutated in patients with cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis patients may actually be protected against typhoid fever infections or infections by the bacteria that cause typhoid fever. So again, very interesting. Another thing that happens is that the Seminella typhi bacteria, once it penetrates into the epithelium, will actually proliferate in the submucosa, causing Peyer's patch hypertrophy. Peyer's patch is lymphatic tissue in the intestines that becomes hypertrophy because the bacteria actually proliferates inside to cause that hypertrophy. And eventually the bacteria will disseminate through the body via the lymphatic system and hematogenously through the blood to cause many of the symptoms we're going to talk about in the next slide. So the clinical presentation of typhoid fever can be summed up by a fever and abdominal pain. But more specifically, with this infection, there's a symptom onset that occurs at roughly 5 to 21 days after ingestion of the bacteria. When the symptoms occur depends on the age of the patient, the health of the patient, the gastric acidity of the patient's stomach, and the number of organisms that are ingested. In the first week of infection, we have what we call a stepwise fever. This is the first symptom you're going to see. Stepwise fever is called that because we see a gradual step-like increase in fever. So you'll see a temperature, it'll bump up to a higher level and it will plateau and then it'll bump up to another higher level and plateau at that. So that's why we call it stepwise. In the second week of infection, this is when we see the abdominal pain. And we also see what we call rose spots. Rose spots are small, usually one to five millimeters in size, blanchable papules. So you're gonna see these on the skin of an infected individual. They're blanchable, so that means that if you actually push on them, they will disappear, but then will reappear. So those are what we call rose spots. And in the third week, you're gonna see some of the worsening symptoms. You're gonna see intestinal bleeding. So you might see hematochesia, melina. You're also gonna get hepatosplenomegaly, so an enlargement of the liver and the spleen, and you could also see intestinal perforation. So essentially, because of all that proliferating bacteria within the submucosa, you might actually cause an intestinal perforation. Other symptoms of typhoid fever are due to the GI system being affected. So you can see diarrhea or constipation. These seem to occur with equal frequency. So about 50% of the time you'll have diarrhea with typhoid fever. The other 50% of the time you'll have constipation. You could also see headaches, disordered sleep patterns, and you can also get what we call typhoid encephalopathy. Typhoid encephalopathy 
causes an altered mental status, confusion, delirium, and even acute psychosis. So how do we make the diagnosis and how do we treat typhoid fever? Diagnosis of typhoid fever is through usually suspecting it in the first place. So you suspect typhoid fever if there is exposure to an endemic area. And if you have been exposed to an area that has a lot of typhoid fever, you're going to suspect it even more if there's three days or more of fever and GI symptoms like the diarrhea and the constipation and the abdominal pain we talked about or the hepatosplenomegaly or the intestinal bleeding. And then once you have suspected it, you can do some tests. You can do blood and stool cultures. You could do a bone marrow test, but that's not going to be something that you are going to do. And a lot of times it can be an empiric diagnosis. You're just going to see the symptoms. You're going to see that they've been in an endemic area. They're not vaccinated. And then you're going to say, you know what, this is probably a diagnosis of typhoid fever. And the treatment of typhoid fever depends on local resistance patterns. So in some parts of the world, you're going to have different strains of Seminella typhi or paratyphi. There could be multi-drug resistance or MDR strains or even extensively drug resistant or XDR strains of this bacteria. And that's going to change which antibiotic you're going to use. Generally speaking, the first line of antibiotics that you're going to use for typhoid fever include fluoroquinolones, azithromycin, ceftriaxone, or carbapenems. And for severe illness, you might want to add on a steroid like dexamethasone. Now, other considerations of typhoid fever include what we call relapse. So a state of relapse generally occurs two to three weeks after resolution of the fever. So what happens is the symptoms of typhoid fever come back after about two to three weeks after having a resolution of the fever. So this is what we call relapse. And this risk of relapse generally depends on the antibiotic that you used. And again, with the local resistance patterns, you're going to want to keep an eye on which antibiotic, depending on the resistance patterns in that area. Another consideration for typhoid fever includes what we call chronic carriage. Chronic carriage is what happens when you have a person that's had typhoid fever, you give them the right antibiotic, they were treated, they no longer have symptoms, they're asymptomatic, and it only happens in a few rare individuals, one to five percent of patients, generally speaking. And what chronic carriage means is that they have been treated, they're asymptomatic, they're feeling better, but they are still excreting the organism even for more than 12 months. And that's generally what we call chronic carriage. So they could be an acute carrier, they could be still excreting the organism, like the Seminola typhi or paratyphi, even after being treated, but when they've are still excreting the organism even more than 12 months after the resolution of the acute illness, we call that chronic carriage. So these people could just have this with them for a long time. The risk factors for chronic carriage include the following. It includes generally adult women, biliary tract disease, like having cholelithiasis, so gallstones. The reason for this is because the Seminella bacteria hides out in the gallbladder. So if there's any gallbladder stones in there, they generally can seed in and cause a biofilm on those gallstones to stay there. And because the Seminella bacteria cause biofilms and stay within the person's gallbladder, the only way we can get rid of them is actually to get rid of the gallbladder. So a cholecystectomy is the treatment for chronic carriers. And another consideration for typhoid fever is prevention of typhoid fever in the first place. And this can occur through having fresh water, sanitation, and hygiene. Remember, a lot of times this is transmitted from contaminated waters. And there's also a vaccination for typhoid fever. So having a vaccine for typhoid fever and having fresh water and sanitation and hygiene can help a lot in preventing this in the first place. So to summarize the other considerations of typhoid fever, we need to worry about a few things. First, we need to worry about relapse. So even if we've treated a patient with typhoid fever, we might not have picked the right antibiotic. The other consideration with typhoid fever is the state of chronic carriage. And this is, again, an asymptomatic state. And this is where that person or individual will excrete Seminella typhi or paratyphi into their environment for extended periods of time. This is what actually happened with typhoid Mary. She was a chronic carrier. She wasn't symptomatic, but she was passing and excreting this organism and infecting many other individuals. And again, the risk factors for chronic carriage include adult women and those with biliary tract diseases, especially cholelithiasis, because gallstones act as a source of that bacteria. And again, the most important thing to take from all of this is prevention of typhoid fever in the first place. Again, we want to have fresh water, sanitation, and hygiene. That is critical to prevent the spread of typhoid fever. And there's a vaccination for typhoid fever that can actually 
reduce or eliminate it or pr help prevent individuals from contracting typhoid fever. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.